stick with it. I mean, it is a two to four to five year process. First of all, I'd say today is the day to start a business. Tomorrow is not as good as today. The reason being, and I know everybody has SHIT on their plate and everything else, but the older you get, the more responsibilities you have. You have a wife, you have kids, you have all these new responsibilities that are gonna make it harder and harder to start a business. Thankfully, I started the last company when I didn't have a wife and I didn't have kids and it was it allowed me to focus all my time, potentially too much time on the business. So I'd say start immediately. Um, and then I would say, uh, just stick with it. Hey everyone, this is Devin Miller here with another episode of The Inventive Journey. I'm your host, Devin Miller, a serial entrepreneur that's uh, grown several startups and the seven, eight figure businesses, as well as the CEO and founder of Miller IP Law, where he helps startups and small businesses with their patents and trademarks. If you ever need help with yours, just go to strategymeeting.com, grab some time with us to chat. Now, today we have another great guest on the podcast, David Wax. And uh, David, uh, in his own words, always wanted to be an entrepreneur. So when he was uh, five, he would uh, go around with his brother's wagon from door to store, selling different stuff, candy. He uh, sold birthday uh, kits for a period of time if people had emergencies <laughs> and everything else, and then started a business while in high school, built and sold computers. To, uh, this was in the day before you would just buy computers off the shelf, so to speak, um, and then did that, went to university, got an engineering degree um, in software as well as in business. Um, and then uh, chose the, the software route, did that work for, uh, do it and work for a startup for a period of time, graduated in 2000, did, also, or did a consulting firm um, with um, help large businesses with .com, um, went and did uh, equity management for a period of time, went into investment firm, did that, um, then moved back to where he was from, which was Phoenix. Um, dad was into real estate and uh, got into doing some uh, real estate related uh, software and programs and getting that. Um, and then sold that uh, business and started his current business. So with yeah. that much as a brief introduction, welcome on the podcast, David. Thank you, Devin. Really, really nice to meet you. And thanks for having me on your show. Absolutely. So, and I just gave a, a brief introduction to um, to your full journey, but uh, yeah. maybe uh, take us back a bit in time and to the, the point where your uh, five-year-old is pulling around your wagon and uh, selling yeah. things to the neighborhood. Yeah. So uh, like you said, I, I always wanted to start a company. So when I was five, my mom would go to Price Club. It wasn't called Costco back then, but Price Club and would buy candies or whatever. And then she'd get annoyed because I'd take the bag of candies, throw it in the back of my brother's wagon and sell it door to door. Once I didn't have any candies to sell. So I looked throughout the house to, for something to sell. And I found the first aid kit. And I went door to door. I was four or five years old, knocked on people's door. When they answered, I said, are there any, any emergencies going on? And they looked at me like, uh, no. I said, okay, I'll try back later. And that was kind of my first bout of entrepreneurship. And then in high school, I started a company called Macrologic Solutions. We built and sold computers. And that business grew bigger than I thought. Um, it was a little hard to shut it down because I didn't want to um, let any of my clients down as far as their technical support needs. But um, it was funny. I used to call up my distributor where I buy the parts. We used to, this is back in the days when people would just build computers. You wouldn't go through Dell. Dell really wasn't a thing yet. So um, I'd call up my distributor and ask for parts. I'd say, hello, this is David Wax. I need these parts. And he'd say, okay, well, um, they'll be ready in, you know, at the end of the day. I said, great, I'll send my delivery boy to go pick them up. And then I get in the car, go down there, pick them up. And he, he was none the wiser. And this went on for months. And then finally, he figured it out that I was the delivery boy and the owner of the company. But that, that business went well. It wasn't mm. huge, but it was big enough where we had a good loyal following and went off to college to really study to start a business because I knew I wanted to do that. So I picked engineering uh, and business from uh, engineering from the University of Pennsylvania, business from the Wharton School there, and all, is this program called Management and Technology. And you could pick your, your engineering concentration or major. And I chose um, software, uh, computer science, because I thought it would be easier to start a software company than a hardware company. That's mm -hmm. why I did it. So. Um, chose uh, computer science, did that, took five years to get out. And then I worked for 
consulting firms and private equity and all the rest. And then uh, ended up working for a venture capitalist in San Diego. Um, and after four months, I was out of my ass. I got fired without cause. I got mm. evicted from my apartment. I got in a car accident in San Diego, which is supposed to have the best weather in the country, flooded incessantly. They were sandbagging around my apartment. Um, mm. So I took the hint <laughs> that things were not going so great in San Diego. And I moved home to, and I could talk about why I got fired and all that. It's not, I, I didn't do anything wrong. It was, it was a crazy experience. But well, now that you're bringing up, you almost have to at least give us a little bit of insight. That's kind of like, there, there's yeah. some joke just right, sort of the punchline. So give us, yes. a little, or yeah, give us a little bit of insight. I worked, I don't want to mention names, but I worked for a maniac uh, venture. I didn't, when, when I was first given the job, I turned it down because it smelled fishy. And then a year later, I was doing equity analysis for Credit Suisse First Boston, and they reached out again, and they said, we wish you'd reconsider. Mm -hmm. And so against my better judgment, I took the job in San Diego that they were not able to fill for a year. I don't know who wouldn't want to live in San Diego and who wouldn't want to work at a venture capital firm, right? But they could mm -hmm. not fill this position for a year. So something was up. But I took the position, and here I am, some kind of smug, cocky, you know, guy that came out of a Ivy League degree thinking I should be working hard on important projects. They had me in the back of their uh, storage room at this VC um, office, organizing random crap that the partner at the VC firm uh, purchased. He was an incessant compulsive buyer. Um, he had 30 portable DVD players all broken, lined up, and I'd have to organize those. He'd buy truck tires for his G-Wagon, and I'd have to haul them out to his car and load them into, he was just, he was crazy. And I'm thinking, this is what I used my degree for and my prior work experience. And then one day he comes into my office screaming, spitting. I remember he was yelling at me so much that there was spit flying out of his mouth. Oh, before that, I was sitting in my office late at night and I'm working on the computer, and I'm all alone in my private office. And we look out onto a common, I looked out onto a common hallway and there was an atrium. And in that atrium, there's a plastic garden owl inside, you know, in this indoor hallway atrium. So I'm working as hard as I can. And, you know, it's late at night, I'm all alone. I keep looking over at that owl. And I say, I'll be damned if there's a camera staring at me from that owl. So I walk over to the owl, I, open, I turn it over and sure enough, a webcam falls out. I'm just like, Jesus. So anyway, so uh, the guy was nuts. He comes mm. into my office screaming one day. I didn't know what he was screaming about. He claimed that I sold some stock without his permission. But anybody who works in La Jolla, California knows this guy and they know he's an, a, a total uh, control freak and he'd never let anybody sell anything without his sign off. And mm -hmm. I didn't know what he was talking about. And I got fired on the spot. And then later, they offered to hire me back if I wrote a letter of apology in writing saying I had sold the stock. And I'm like, are you nuts? <laughs> I'm not doing that. I have nothing. So anyway, so uh, I got fired. At the same time, San Diego, this is back in 03 or 04, 03, I guess, mm -hmm. or can never keep it straight, but uh, it was, you know, the, the real estate prices were going through the boom, you know, through were going through a boom. And my landlord was crazy about real, everybody was crazy about real estate. And I got fired, I got evicted because they wanted to sell the place. So um, it was all very strange. Um, they had some guy show up at my door doing this motion. And I found it very, uh, you know, pounding your fist into your palm. I found it very amusing. But anyway, got evicted from my, my apartment, which was good because that broke my lease just as I was fired. So it all worked out. But I moved back to Phoenix where I grew up and my, you know, I was kind of head between my legs because over my prior work experience, I made pretty good money, but I spent it all paying down school debt. I had a really uh, five years of Ivy League schooling and it was very expensive and I had to pay it off myself. So I spent all my money paying down school debt and I had zero nest egg. So when I got, you know, there was no rainy day fund. When I got fired, I had nothing, I had no money. So I moved back to Arizona with my head between my legs and I started talking to my dad 
Um, and, and I said, you know, I don't know what to do. And he said, why don't you do something? It was his idea, do something with blackberries and barcodes to provide information on houses. This was before the iPhone. And QR codes were kind of out, but not what they are today. And I said, well, I don't know about Blackberries and barcodes, but why not do text messaging where you could text in for information on a house. Um, you'd see a sign hanging from the real estate sign. It's called a writer. It's the little thing that sometimes says, you know, number of bedrooms or baths or I'm beautiful inside. We created a writer that said, text this number, uh, house one, two, three, four, five to this number to get info on the house. When you did that, you get the realtor would get your lead, but you would get pictures of the inside of the house and a description of the house because the flyer boxes were often empty. Mm -hmm. So I said, why don't I do that? He said, okay. So he gave me a roof over my head. I was then on unemployment, but because he came up with the idea and he was my partner, even though he didn't, he just gave me a roof over my head. He got 25. He actually got 50% uh, of the company, which moved down to 25%, which was still way too much, but he ended up with 25% of the company. Um, I never really liked the real estate space. So at the same time, I at the same time as developing house for sale, which was that solution, I developed something else called coupon zap, which was texting for restaurants and bars to send out drink alerts and uh, happy hour specials. Just, uh, you're going back really quick. I, I, I definitely yeah. I don't mean to interrupt your journey. So you did that with your partner. And it could yeah. sounds like it's even today with real estate, it doesn't sound like it's a bad thing if you're driving by and saying, okay, yeah. like, get a little bit more, see the pictures inside, see what's going on, yes. and get the details before I go into the house and see whether or not I'm interested. Just curious, where did that business go to? Or where did, is it still live today? Is it still going? Did you sell it off? Did you shut it down? That was all part of, yeah, that was part of Sell It. So the Umbrella Company had two products. It had House for Sell and Coupons app. House for Sell, I found very frustrating. So um, the business kind of died a natural death caused by iPhone apps. And, you know, anybody could use, you could drive up in front of a house, use Zillow and get all the info you needed. Back mm -hmm. then that, you know, back in 2004, 2005, there was no iPhone, there was no Zillow, there, that just didn't exist. So you didn't have those options. But um, I, I, I started going to real estate shows with my sales force and that type of thing. And dealing with realtors can be very difficult. Uh, no offense to your realtor clients, but I find that and your realtor listeners, but they're I'm not of one sure that they're, they're the they're the cream of the crop. So we're talking about those other ones, right? right? I find they're of one of two camps. They're either too poor to afford twenty four ninety nine a month for three real three signs and the service that goes with it, or they're so rich, you, what you offer them doesn't matter, so they're not interested. So they're either fat and happy or poor and uh, uh, you know broke. Um, and regardless, it's $24.99. They always want a deal. They always want to, you know, that's what realtors do. They negotiate. So you go to these trade shows, you're like, it's $24.99 and they want to haggle and deal. And I'm like, screw this. So, um, so that's what happened. But we were the first real player in the text in for real estate space. Um, at the same time, I created coupon zap. And then what happened was I was sitting, it was a very small company. I was sitting in that apartment my dad gave me, I'm drinking, you know, I, it was classic startup. I had the two liter of Diet Mountain Dew next to me and I'm, you know, programming away, getting these things going. And I got a call from Marie Claire Magazine and they wanted to use a text message solution to allow people to text in for products in their magazine. So you'd see a page in the magazine you know, you'd see some makeup or something and it'd say, text this to this number to get info on, on, the, on the makeup. And I'm thinking to myself, that's house for sale. That's the real estate offering. They just don't know it. So I charged that. I didn't charge them $24.99, but I charged them, a, you know, a relatively obscene amount of money for this offering. Um, and then that's where house for sale really went. It, I, I didn't really focus on realtors. I focused, I focused on apartment management and cars. So we had Forent Media Solutions, which is still somewhat of a player, but I, I don't know if you remember 15 years ago, you'd go to the, um, the supermarket and you get the little magazine of Forent and it, would, it was like a little directory of all the apartments for rent and you could 
uh, what we did was you could text in and get more info straight to your phone. So that was house for sale, but for apartments. And then we did auto trader, truck trader, RV trader, um, all the traders, they were all owned by Cox and you know th that type of thing. So we would do the employment guide, all those rags were all owned by the same people and we powered the texting for that. Cool. At the same time, Coupon Zapped, which I targeted to restaurants and bars, and our first client ended up just signing up online was a strip club. I'm like, go figure. So we had a few of those too. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that was, they just signed up. We weren't targeting them. Um, then what happened is we got into Abercrombie and Fitch, Toys R Us, Sam's Club, Office Max, and we were doing millions of messages a day um, for these major brands. So that business got pretty big. Um, then when the iPhone came out in 08, I was worried that would just squash the business mm -hmm. because why do you need texting if you have this amazing phone? But what it did was it increased our business because people were so used to pressing, you know, the two key three times to get a C, you know, two, 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 you know, you know, you had those old key, uh, they, you'd have to tap each key so many times to, to text. It was hard, but when the iPhone came out and Android, it made texting super easy. So our business took off. Um, and then we also got into apps a little bit. Like we wrote, I didn't love apps because I didn't see it as a scalable business, but we wrote apps for auto trader and, and uh, for rent media solutions and some restaurant groups, that type of thing. So that, that business um, did well. And mm -hmm. I saw some, so our core was really the texting and then we had the iPhone app and all that, which I saw as a commodity because um, there are a bunch of people making iPhone apps. Um, but the, the texting core, we were really, really good at. But at the same time, there's a lot of compliance coming down the pipe as far as if you accidentally send somebody a text that they were not opted into, um, it could be a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Just um, it could be, I believe, $800 per occurrence. Mm -hmm. So what happened was, uh, and you know this more than me, Devin, being an, a lawyer, but what happened was we had um, a large restaurant group in Chicago using us. And there's a kid at Northwestern University in the law school. And he forgot conveniently that he had signed up for text messages through this restaurant group. So when he got a text message from us, he ran to a class action lawyer and said, um, you know, I got this unsolicited text, $800. They probably sent 10,000. You know, it could be, the, the fees could literally be in the billions. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I, luckily we were able to find that this guy did sign up. So, you know, we gave him the finger and sent him on his way. <laughs> uh, but, but the stress of that business. And then I also saw things like push notifications and other, you know, I saw text message marketing kind of potentially on the way down. So I wanted out. Mm -hmm. So I sold that company to ePrize, which was a, um, a company doing online promotions. And they wanted a mobile uh, component. And then the next day I started handwritten, which is what I do now. So that's a long, a long journey, but that's kind of the more interesting one. No, so that, was, that was definitely fun to hear that journey. And it's interesting kind of how you weaved it through. So I, I loved hearing it. So now I'm going to ask you kind of the whole question because yeah. you sold that business. Definitely makes sense. You know, you got push notification. Although I still think it sounds like it's a cool business. I'd still use it today, but I get yeah. where. It, you know, push notifications, emails, you got so many different things blast yeah. all the time. Although interestingly enough, one of the things that people still tend to respond to and be more engaging with is text messaging. So oh, you're yeah. still ahead of your time and it's still a great uh, place, but you know, you sold that off and now you're saying, okay, kind of what am I gonna do next? So, and you know, that leads to, to handwritten. Yeah. But, you know, how did you come to that idea or how did you kind of come up with that and kind of how'd you get that one started? So I'd always, you know, I'm a mama's boy and uh, around her birthday every year, I'd want to send her a birthday card. So I'd stop off. I was living in Chicago. So I'd stop off at the Wal Walgreens on the way to the train and I'd pick up a birthday card and it would then sit in my laptop bag and never get sent. It would get bent up and wrinkled and all the rest because I'm lazy. And then I noticed when I'd walk into my salespeople's offices and my own office, anytime somebody sent me a handwritten card or a handwritten note, not only would I read it, I would keep it. I would put it on display. 
So when I went to sell or when I sold Sell It, um, I sent handwritten notes to all my best clients and to my employees with best intentions. Um, but my hand started cramping and I ran out of stationery and I screwed up notes and I'd have to rewrite them 10 times. And I just thought, gee, there has to be a better way. So what if I can make sending legit pen-based written in ink, handwritten notes as easy as sending an email? Um, at the same time, I also saw the, you know, the number of emails that were going out. You know, it's, there's stats out there from back then even. So it's worse now that the average office worker gets like 150 emails a day. They spend 24% of their time just managing their inbox. So email is a chore. And then you add, I was part of the problem. We're sending text messages. People get thousands of text messages a month. You know, you're managing that. So you're inundated with all this electronic communication. And then it wasn't around back then, although it is now, Slack and WeChat and tweets and Facebook notifications and face, you know, all these other forms of electronic communication. Um, uh, and it's just overwhelming and it's all noise. And nobody really gives it any um, any credence because it's all automatable. Even you know, if I were to send you an email that said, "Dear Devin, comma, thank you for having me on your podcast," or you might have sent me one like that. Thanks for having you. You know, it was probably automated, and mm -hmm. I uh, I discount it in my head. I'm like, oh, that's an automated. Even though there's nothing in there that that has a graphic or anything else, I just know it's automated. Sure. So I no, thought, there's definitely a lot of things and we use automation. And, yeah. there's, and I, I think that there is that kind of that difference of it, if it's handwritten. Now, I do have one question, then we'll get to kind of where you're yeah. at today. But, you know, it seems like, and although I have absolutely no idea that with all the technology, you could make a printer that makes it a, looks very, it's, I would, uh, maybe yeah. not, because I've never seen it, that you could do it so a printer would make it look just like handwritten. But what's the difficulty or you know, because I'm guessing that you explored that or looked into it, or, you know, maybe my assumption's wrong, but, you know, what is the reason why a printer can't do that handwritten type or look and feel to it? It's just so, the impression and pushing down and be, be able to see the difference? Yes. Yeah, so it's a few things. So typically we'll write on stationery that, so there's a company out there called Postable that does exactly what you say. They will, you type in a note, they will laser print it in a quote unquote, realistic looking handwriting style. Um, and when you get it, you'll know it's laser printed. There's just a, there's something about a laser print that maybe they haven't mastered, but it's masterable. Um, for us, we often write on very high quality stationery that we can't really reef, you know, I mean, we, we laser print the stationery. So I get, you know, using our digital presses. So I guess we could, but then we also have some clients like some high-end luxury brands that send us foiled and embossed stationery. We can't feed that through a laser printer. It just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then also people do the smear test. They will lick their finger and it'll smear. And then also uh, the way a pen follows the bumps of the paper, we use toothy paper intentionally. It just tends to look different. Now, that's not to say that down the road, we're not going to explore um, creating images of what we would write and then laser uh, ink jetting or laser printing that on a page as a low, as a lo lesser cost version of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. That's potential. Um, but right now we're trying to provide the best, most realistic, highest end version. And that is written in pen. And it does leave indents on the paper and it um, follows the nooks and crannies of the paper and it does pass the smear test. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's interesting. And it, it's probably one of the hard things is to introduce imperfections. In other words, a lot of times when you handwrite something, it's you know yeah. bigger and smaller. And, yes. You know, and you scribble something out or you, you know, you don't write it per quite perfectly. Yeah. And it's almost harder to make something imperfect as opposed to perfect when you try and do that. So I, I just thought it was interesting. Yeah. It seems like, oh, there's so many different ways. And yet, you know, I, you never see that there's really something that can replace a handwritten note if that's, you know, if you want to have that kind of feel to it. And we even do that with some of the letter, you know, some of the things we do, we'll do different gift boxes and letters and things we'll send out to clients. 
And, you know, some of it we'll do as a, you know, kind of a mailer that's printed mm -hmm. out. But a lot of times we'll still, even if nothing else, put a handwritten address on the envelope such that they know that it's from us and that somebody actually took the time to send them out to it specifically as opposed to just, you know, kind of hundreds going out. So it's always yeah. interesting to, to keep that personal touch. So now that you kind of had the idea, you built the business and you've been in business, you know, just give, you know, is it as you've built that up and, and, you know, kind of figured out how to do that, has it been a rocket ship to the top? Has it been one where it's been hard to find the right or market fit? Has it been ups and downs or kind of how's it gone? The first several years were very slow. Um, and that was probably twofold. Number one, I wasn't hundred percent focused on it after selling the last company. Um, I, uh, immediately turned around and started this one. And I also met a, wa a woman and got married and, you know, moved and all this stuff. So my focus wasn't entirely there. That's part of it. The other part of it is, uh, and this is getting, um, a little bit, um, theoretic or, um, philosophical, I should say, we didn't have our own robots. And because we didn't have our own, we were using an off the, off, off the shelf solution, which was crappy. Um, but it, I feel bad saying that if they're listening, but um, th that solution was no good. In order to really scale the business, we needed our own robot. And I honestly believe there's a little bit in, of, if you build it, they will come. Um, I mean, when we had, when we were in a tiny little space, we got enough business to fill that tiny little fulfillment space. Then we got a bigger space and we filled that space. And now we're in 10,000 square feet and we're filling that space. There's, you have to have the space to allow the business to grow and you have to have the capacity to allow the business to grow. And now we have 115 robots, uh, you know, 40 people. We've got the capacity there and we're growing into it pretty quickly pretty quickly. The last three, four years have been great growth. Um, we made the Inc. 500 list last year. We'll make it again this year. Um, pretty, pretty good numbers on like 148, I think. Um, so we're, we're doing pretty well growth now, but it's also a lot of small numbers. We were very tiny four years ago. Um, so, so yeah, we're, we're, we're doing well now. Um, we're at a good clip. We're hiring a lot of people, that type of thing. People are finding out about us. You know, we are a very niche business. It's not like everybody needs handwritten notes. Um, but uh, as people learn about us, we're, we're fortunate to, to, to build the business pretty quickly. So yeah, not as fast as sell it. The, the text messaging company, I was right place, right time. And it grew, it grew fast. Oh, cool. No, and it's, it's always fun because, I mean, you know, you see a business in several years and most time people think, oh, they're just doing great. And they've got all these clients. It's like, oh, they must have just they had a great idea. And it's like, no, there's almost always inevitably that build to the business. Oh, yeah. Years and there's that. But you always just hear this is where they're at today and they're on the list. And it's, you know, it's, it's going great. And it's like you never get to hear that backstory. And yet there's always that, you know, I didn't know if it would work and if it works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, the market fit and everything else. So appreciate that that insight. So. Well, yeah, I would say if you can, ahead. if you can get the business going in two years, <laughs> you know, and if depending on how you look at it, two years is a long time or two years is not a long time. When you're in it, two years is a long time. When you look back, two years is not a long time, but it took sell it a solid two years where I could afford to live. Um, and then it started taking off handwritten. Um, it's taken, it took, we're now in year seven and a half. It took a solid four years. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, you have to be patient. Um, you have to be patient. No, and I, and I like that. Cause I think that, you know, too often people get the glamorized Hollywood version of overnight success and it's right. overnight success, 10 years in the making. And even if the business goes quicker than that is, Hey, I did start us before that. And I did, you know, things before that and gained experience and things didn't work out. And I learned my lessons and I had ups and downs, yeah. all that goes into it. And yet we get the kind of, Hey, get rich quick and it's going to be an overnight success. And you have, you know, it's great to hear that for 99.9% .9 of people, it's not that way. Absolutely. As, as we wrap up towards the end, and there's always more things I'd love to dive in on the technology and how things are going and where things are headed. And maybe we'll, we'll probably have to have you on again another time because I think it'd be fun to dive into that. But as we wrap up this episode, I always have two questions at the end of each podcast. So we'll jump to those now. So the first question I always ask is along your journey, what was the worst business decision you ever made? And what did you learn from it? Um, the worst business decision was I, 
honestly involving not thinking through the ramifications of becoming business partners with my my father. Um, first of all, I will never, I love my parents dearly, but I will never, ever go into business with family again. The dynamics of family are never appropriate to business. Um, I don't want my kids to go into my business. You know, uh, it's just, it's not right. In the end, I don't care if he's a minority shareholder, he's still my father, right? So you can't have the same conversation in a business context with somebody if they're your father, it just doesn't work well. And, and you can't pull away the equity. He didn't deserve, there was a time, um, I, I don't wanna get into it, but there was a time when I should have pulled away more equity and um, I didn't. Um, I'm happy that he walked away with 25% of the company because it provided a lifestyle adjustment for him and took care of him. And I, I gave some to my mom and I'm, I'm hoping, um, you know, some of that will trickle down to the other, my brothers and stuff. God forbid when, 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 the, when you know, when things happen, I, I don't even want to think about that, but I'm glad that I was able to provide for the family that way, but I shouldn't have had my hand forced. And, and it wasn't because if I think back to 2004, when I started sell it, it was my fault for making a bad decision and saying, oh, sure, 50-50. No, it was, it shouldn't have been that way. Um, it should have been 5% or something, um, mm. given what he had, or he should have had to put more money in. Yeah, that's that was thing, struggling. You know, it's interesting you hit on that. And I think family dynamics always add in, yeah. you know, even more complexity because one year, if you were working with someone that you never knew, you'd probably be a more shooting negotiator. Yes. Or family always there want you have that extra, hey, I don't want to offend them. I got to see them at Christmas and Thanksgiving. Yep. And then if things don't go as well, you want to salvage your relationship. And so, you know, it can also be very positive. Working with family can have the added benefit of you know the person you're working with, you know that you have a good relationship with them, you know their strengths or weaknesses, and they'll be more forgiving when you mess up and all that. So it's, it's, it is that interesting dynamic. Yeah. I think family, sometimes it works out awesome. Other times you're saying, I wish I'd never done it. So it's always one of those balances. So I, I love that uh, mistake and lesson learned from that. Second question I always ask is, and just as a reminder, before we get to the second question, um, for those of you listener, if you were, we do have the bonus question this episode where we'll talk a little bit about intellectual property. So if you want to hear us talk a little bit about that after the normal episode wraps up, definitely stay tuned. Now with the second question, which yeah. is, if you're talking with somebody that's just getting into a startup or a small business, what'd be the one piece of advice you'd give them? Um, stick with it. I mean, it is a two to four to five year process. First of all, I'd say, Today is the day to start a business. Tomorrow is not as good as today. The reason being, and I know everybody has SHIT on their plate and everything else, but the older you get, the more responsibilities you have. You have a wife, you have kids, you have all these new responsibilities that are gonna make it harder and harder to start a business. Thankfully, I started the last company when I didn't have a wife and I didn't have kids and it, was, it allowed me to focus all my time, potentially too much time on the business. So I'd say start immediately. Um, and then I would say, uh, just stick with it. You have to adjust the business to market demand and needs you see coming at you, but stick with it. Um, stick with the core, you know, find what your core is. And that can be, you know, again, it can bend and ebb and flow, but stick with it for at least two years because you only lose, quote unquote, lose when you give up. It's not like a, a baseball or basketball game that has a number of innings or a time limit. You only lose when you give up. So if you can stick with it, um, you know, I was working two jobs when I started to sell it. Um, but yeah, and I was on unemployment for part of the time. So if you can figure out ways to stick with it, um, you know, that's what separates um, those that make it and those that don't. No, and I like that. And I think that, you know, now the way I'll, I'll flavor that is doesn't mean you stick with it. You never adjust, you never pivot, you never right. adapt you, because you, adjust. That you got to adjust because there's always going to be, uh, you know, those things that come up that you didn't anticipate or the market's telling you something different. So I think stick with it and be willing to adjust and pivot. And with yes. both of those as characteristics and because you, you don't want to get locked in and say, oh, I got to just stay with this. And then this is my idea. And if I push hard enough, because sometimes it's not a bad, it's not a good idea or it's a good idea, but it's not implemented correctly. Right. Or you got to find a different marketplace. Absolutely. You got to listen to the feedback. But I love that because I think there's definitely a lot of value and a lot of wisdom to that. 
Well, as we wrap up and before we dive to the, the bonus question, if people want to use your service, they want to be a customer, they want to be a client, they want to be an investor, they want to be an employee, they want to be your next best friend, any or all of the above, what's the best way to reach out to you, contact you or connect up to you or find out more? Yeah, well, uh, please visit handwritten.com. It's H-A-N-D-W-R-Y-T-T-E-N. Um, if you want to sign up, use discount code podcast and you'll get $5 in free credit. Send yourself or a loved one a card. Um, there's also a way on there. If you click business, you can get a whole sample kit. So see for yourself if it passes the sniff test and the lick test and all the rest. Um, I'm David B as in boy, W-A-C-H-S at Twitter. So at David B. Wax um, or LinkedIn, just look for David on handwritten at, uh, at LinkedIn. Um, those are the best ways or David at handwritten is my email address. So feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, happy to happy to chat and discuss, you know, either my journey or hopefully handwritten if you're interested in using the service. Awesome. Well, I definitely uh, encourage people to, to check it out, use the $5 discount code, and otherwise uh, see if it can, there can't be a place that you can use it both in your business or in your personal life, either way. Right. Uh, but I uh, appreciate that offer. Um, well, thank you again for coming on the podcast. It's been a fun. It's been a pleasure. Now, for all of you that are listeners, if you have your own journey to tell and you'd like to uh, be a guest on the podcast, feel free to go to inventiveguest.com and apply to be on the show. We'd love to have you and share your journey. Two more things as a listener. One, make sure to click subscribe in your podcast player so you know when all of our awesome episodes come out. And two, leave us a review so other people can find out about all of our awesome episodes. Last but not least, if you ever need help with patents, trademarks, or anything else to do business, go to strategymeeting.com and we're always here to help and love to chat with you. So with that, now it's, uh, it's that fun part. And it's always yeah. fun. All the episodes are fun and all the parts of the episodes are fun. But I always enjoy talking a little about intellectual property because that's always a, a bit of my passion. So um, it's always fun to do the bonus question. So with that, I'll turn it over to you to ask yeah. your uh, number one intellectual property question. So I have a competitor local in town in Phoenix that has totally ripped off our website. Like on our website, we have a picture of a robot pen. Their website, a picture of a robot pen. Our website, it says integrate and automate. Their website, integrate and automate. They've just gone point by point and created a dollar store knockoff, of, as I call it, of our website. What can we do to protect the website, the external WordPress website that ebbs and flows? You know, do, do we take screenshots of that and copyright it, trademark it? What do we do? to protect against these jerks from doing what they're doing yeah, if anything or do we just yeah. say it's not worth it <laughs> you know and i'll answer I'll, I'll ask one question i don't normally try and answer a question with a question because it always drives me nuts but let me give one follow-up question so i can give a fuller answer which is are when they, they knocking it off are they also knocking off the actual brand the name of the company or did they at least rename it they renamed it uh okay. offer a similar service using the old crappy robots we no longer use the off-the-shelf ones um, they offer a similar service, but um, I, I just don't appreciate their, uh, you know, um, the plagiarism. No, and I definitely get that. And that plagiarism, because if they, and no, this wasn't your case, but I'll give the, the background as to why I asked that. If, if they had copied your trait, you know, the, the, your brand, in other words, the name of your company or the name of the products, you, you know, a cash yeah. raise or something of that, if they're copying those type of things, that falls under trademarks. In other words, if it's your brand and they're saying, hey, we are trying to make it so that, you know, our, our, the name of our business or our URL confuses people that way, or the name of a cash phrase, the name of a product or service, that all, all fun falls under trademarks and branding. So where they haven't done that, then you would, and or in, adi in addition, if they had done that, you also have what's called copyrights. And that's kind of what you refer more to of, you know, this is the images we use, the look and the feel, you know, of our website. And they've, you know, they've either copied it or they've, made it so substantially similar that they're trying to cause confusion. And that oftentimes will fall under copyrights. Now, copyrights are going to be, there's kind of a blatant copyright ripping off. If they actually took your exact language mm -hmm. or they took the actual image, then that's, you know, are infringing on your copyright or copyrights. And so that would be one thing is to, you could go register those copyrights. Then you can see, you know, how much you want to ratchet it up as far as um, you know, going after them. And that's always kind of a balance of the return on investment. If they're a small startup that doesn't make hardly any revenue, they're not eating into your business, then you got to decide, do I want to kind of, for lack of a better word, squash them now or, you know, stop it before it builds or you're saying, hey, it, they're just a small business. I think they're going to go out of business. It's not worth investing a lot of money into this. Then you may just say it's not worthwhile. 
but I'll take it for the example, at least of this discussion, that they're at least gotten big enough that you're wanting to, they're impeding on your business or otherwise there's a, a fear there, or a worry there that it's worthwhile to go after them. Then I would probably, one, I would register the copyrights, you know, your website, you can take screenshots of either all of the website or if there's particular parts or they're most important, you register those. You don't have to register copyrights, but what it does is one, it shows that you have ownership, shows as at least of by this date, we we established our copyrights to that copyright. And it also gives you more um, more benefits as far as going after damages. In other words, because you've registered it, because it's a, a registered copyright, when you go after them or if you need to go after them, you can get increased damages for their, their infringing of copyrights. The last part of that, and I know it's a bit of a longer answer and I try and condense it down into a shorter answer, um, is you can also go after more anti-competitive nature. In other words, they are, and that can kind of fall under copyrights, it can fall under trademarks or a combination of both. But in other words, their overall motivation is they're not just trying to compete outright with you. And if they were, they, they can certainly compete. They can go buy right. the off-the-shelf product. But if they're trying to simulate making it basically confusing so that the customers think that it is your website or is associated with you or it's the same look and feel and they're otherwise riding your coattails then it's almost that anti-competitive nature and then there are a few ways to kind of go about that by saying it's not you know not quite to the antitrust but kind of the, along those same lines and we could dive into that as a separate conversation gets a little bit more legalistic but there are kind of those things as well when they're trying to actively cause confusion in the marketplace there are additional avenues to go as well so those are a few thoughts. It's an, a great question, it's a more complicated answer than I can fully embellish in the, the end of the podcast. Yeah. But definitely, if you or the listeners, if you have any follow up questions or the listeners do, or you have any other questions, feel free to go to strategymeeting.com. We're always happy to chat, answer questions, and make sure you get taken care of. With that, we'll go ahead and uh, end the podcast and appreciate coming on, David. The, the podcast has been a fun, it's been a pleasure, and wish the next leg of your journey even better than the last. Thanks, Devin. Uh,